Greetings and salutations, and welcome to another episode of the Talking NorCal podcast, the official podcast of Active NorCal. I am your host, Zach, and with me here, as always, it is uh, Camelback Bob. Sure, Camelback Bob. Nice hat. That's a great hat. Appreciate it. Camelback shout out. Awesome golf course. One of these days, I'm actually going to plan out a nickname for you, uh, because I'm I'm doing pretty poorly recently on That's giving okay. you a fun nickname. So we're on episode like 31. So you're going to run out eventually. I'm, I, I, I did run out a long time ago. Um, I'm actually super excited for this episode today. We have a ton of cool stuff to talk about, including we are joined by the two women behind the SAC Source to Sea, the 400 mile kayak trip from Mount Shasta to San Francisco Bay. We have Alyssa Winkleman and Ari Cassell on the podcast. They are badass women who did this uh, trip. There were three of them. They did this trip from um, the source of the Sacramento River through the entire Sacramento River and um, out to the San Francisco Bay. Uh, just such a cool adventure, and they're actually creating a documentary about it. And so it, it was great to talk to them about the project, about their journey, and what they have coming up. Um, So that's coming up in a little bit. Before we begin, be sure to check out the Active NorCal store. It's store.activenorcal.com. We got all sorts of swag. We got shirts. We got sweatshirts. We got hats. We got stickers. Um, Get swaggy like us with the Active NorCal store. Use the code NorCal to get 10% off your first purchase. N-O-R-C-A-L NorCal. Um, we're excited to, to, uh, rep Northern California with our gear. So we hope you're excited as well. Hella merch. Hella merch. We got hella, hella shirts. Um, so go check it out. Rep NorCal support us. We appreciate it. Let's hop right into this awesome episode. I'm really excited with the Tahoe's Hella NorCal. NorCal, we're Hella NorCal. And I could spend all day just chilling in the South Bay. We're NorCal. We're hella NorCal, and there are no salad dudes who kick it down in Santa Cruz or NorCal. We're hella NorCal, and we get a little cray cray when we visit the East Bay. We're NorCal. We're hella NorCal. It is a beautiful spring day here in Northern California, and I was very happy last week to make a trip up north to shoot some content, to see some friends, to have some fun. Um, so we're going to go back to, we're going to start this episode by going back to one of our old tropes, Adventures Adventures in in NorCal. I missed this segment and this was a unique adventure time for you because you went alone. I went all by myself. Solo trip where you had to set up all the cameras yourself. You know, that brings a lot of additional, uh, troubles. It, It was difficult in that it's very difficult, like on the trail or or whatever, like setting up the shot and talking to the camera and making sure everything looks good. That being said, um, it was actually kind of nice because you know how I'm sometimes all over the place. Yeah, uh, I know. I was able to be all over the place without you like making me stick to a schedule. And you so, still were able to accomplish all of your goals. I accomplished everything, yeah. So there are certainly downsides, but at the same time, I can like... I can just kind of willy nilly go through things and and change the schedule if I need to. Um, and what what some people may not think about is when you're going on one of these trips solo, like when when you're doing a hiking video, you got to set up the camera, walk by it, then turn around, come back, get the camera, and then keep hiking. So it's like there's it's a lot easier to do that when you have two people. And so it almost is makes it much more work hiking wise when you're going on a hike and video. You also have to do it with like a bunch of people hiking around you. And every single person says, Oh, what are you doing? Or when you have, you're talking to a camera and people are just like, what are you talking to? You know, it It looks weird when you're you're just talking to a camera, but yeah. Yeah. But it worked out. I got this brand new tripod that worked fantastically. I'm really Really excited that I bought that. Um, so I did four things on this trip. I hiked to the top of Castle Craig's. I biked the uh, Lake Siskiyou Loop in uh, Mount Shasta. Regular there. bike or e-bike? Regular mountain bike. Mountain bike. It's a dirt path for the most part. I golfed at the Mount Shasta Resort, and I fished in Clear Creek and Redding. 
Okay, so let's start in order here with the question. So uh, I don't know when the last time we climbed Cl- Castle Crags was. Personally, it's probably been 20 years. 20, at least 20. How was it? So, How was the hike? Uh, initial reaction, it was a lot harder than I remember. I can imagine. It's, it's I believe, total, it's, it's 5.6 miles. Round trip? Round trip. Oh, really? But it's, it's dead, dead straight up. No switchbacks. No, yeah, not really even no switchbacks, kind of like some here and there, but it's really, it starts straight up and it just continues straight up for 2,000 feet for whatever, 2.8 miles, I, I believe it is. So, um, and then when, once you get about a halfway there, maybe three quarters of the way there, it gets super rocky. So it's, you're just, you're, you're kind of inching up the hill because there's a lot of rocks and you don't want to slip on a loose rock especially when I'm carrying, you know, $3,000 worth of camera equipment. So that was great. I mean, there, there's some fantastic views up there and, you know, of Mount Shasta. Uh, I did the Castle Dome hike, which the, that's like the big, big rock that sticks out. Um, and then you get to the top and there's all the the different spires and everything. So that was great. It was just, it was a lot more difficult than I remember. I also, I bought, <laughs> I bought some new hiking shoes, which I... Shoes, I, not boots? Like hiking I, shoes? I wanted like some more sleeker hiking shoes for this weekend. And um, I found this used rack at REI. <laughs> you bought used shoes? I bought used shoes. They were they're really nice hiking boots, but I'm they sure were they used. Are. And um, they were terrible. I was like, my calves were killing me after the first mile. And I'm like, okay, do I hike back? and get my regular hiking boots or, and so I just kept with it. So I was super sore. Oh, your, your hiking boots are starting to fall apart now. No, 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 no. I've oh, got, I got new so ones. Good. Yeah, um, yeah. So how long did it take you round trip to, to do the whole hike? With filming everything, it was about four, maybe four and a half, probably more like four and a half hours. That's not bad actually. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I get, I try to get most of my shots on the way up. Um, and then, and then I just, hoof it down and I try to, if I, if I've missed anything, I'll grab that. Um, but I, I'm glad I got there super early and I'm glad because there was a huge, uh, group of people coming up after me and you could tell which people are like in hiking shape and which people just thought like, Oh, we'll hike to the top of Castle Creek. Cause some people were about halfway up when I was heading down and they were like, how far is it? Oh my goodness. So it was funny because, you know, I don't remember it being that hard when we were kids. Well, we were 15 years old. It, 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 at the oldest, I would say, yeah. And so it's funny doing it as an adult and realizing uh, it's much more difficult. But it's beautiful and it's well worth the hike. Full video of that to come. So the Full next, video coming soon, yep. The next place you went was the the Lake Siskiyou Loop. Now, I'm pre- Lake Siskiyou is the, the lake we pass when we're going to, like, uh, uh, Castle, Castle Lake right. and Heart Lake. So yeah. I, oh, we might, I might have stopped there once, but I've never really spent a lot of time in that area. How, how long is the ride around? It's seven like, miles nice. around, and um, it is awesome actually because it's mostly flat. It's just a, like they built it just along the base of the lake, so there's not much up and down. It's pretty negligible, and. You can stop through. You can stop at uh, the Lake Siskiyou Resort, and they have food. And it's not open yet because it's it's still early season. But they, you know, they have the restaurant and they have the beach. Incredible views of uh, Mount Shasta, and and actually, it's if you're staying at that resort, that's a really good bike ride. It didn't take me that long at all. Maybe, I mean, stopping and shooting on the bike makes a big difference compared to hiking. Uh, it may have took me two hours at the most. Um, but it's just that that it's just view after view after view, and if you like load up a fishing pole on your your backpack, you can throw out a line. They stock that lake with a ton of fish. And you should have. I I know I thought about it. I didn't have enough time. And um, there's also the ribbon bridge is right there, which is super unique, and uh, and you can get like great pictures of. Um, the ribbon bridge with Mount Shasta behind it. So that was a beautiful hike. It's or not hike a bike. And it was, uh, it was actually pretty easy. So, um, that video's coming out soon as well. Seven mile bike ride around a, a, a lake. That sounds awesome to me. I'm oh, gonna... except there was a price. So I looked it up on the map and they had like X's on it saying there's issues on the trail. And when I got there, you, I had to, <laughs> 
I had to lift up my bike and cross two different sections of the river. Um, so it's just because it's early season conditions where when there's not so much snow melt coming through, you can get across it pretty easily. But I literally, it took me a while to like find a good spot to cross and I had to lift the bike over my head and cross, you know, I guess that's the Sacramento river coming into it or the, the snow melt from Mount Shasta. But so it, early season, it's kind of an issue, but, um, it wasn't too, too bad at all. Little hurdle, but you made yeah. your way through it. Yep. Now the, the third one, probably the thing I'm most jealous that I missed out on was, uh, a, a round at the golf course at Mount Shasta resort. Yeah, that, uh, I was, I was going to shoot a video of it and I started and it just did not work the way it was set up. I was by myself and. So a couple holes in, I just scrapped the whole plan and just played golf. It, it was that was after actually um, Castle Creek. So I had already hiked like same six, day. So I had already hiked six miles. I was pretty sore. I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna have a beer, relax, play golf. So what did you shoot. What did I shoot? 85. I think, I think. you told me you shot an 88, but I could be wrong. Definitely wasn't an 88 because it's it's a par uh, 70. Could be an 86. Yeah, maybe an 86. Could have been an 86. But that course, it's super unique. It well, for one, it's got views of Mount Shasta the whole way. But like every hole is unlike anything you see, you know, in the flatland. Like everything's elevated, or you're shooting down, or you're dog leg left and right. And um, it's a super fun course. What was interesting is I went. I had my tee time at 3:45. I arrived early, and no one was in front of me. It took me two hours to shoot 18 holes. That's insane. That's a record. I mean, that's by far a record for me. I mean, 18 holes should take you four hours. I was just zipping through. There was no one there. Um, but that, I mean, and the views, it's a, it's a really nice course, actually. And uh, the views of Mount Shasta are just stellar. I so. remember playing there uh, in some early, probably late teenage years with my friend Alex, who actually proposed to his fiance on top of Castle Crags. Uh, and obviously I didn't care anything about golf back then. We just wanted to go around, have a good time, try to get the golf cart stuck in the mud, which we did, I think, successfully do. But I would love to go back to that Mount Shasta Golf Resort uh, now that I'm serious, more serious about golf at least. I'll tell you, I made the turn. When I made the turn, I think I was shooting a 38 and I just, I just did terrible on the back nine. So it's actually a pretty easy, it's a short course and there's legit like four holes that you can hit the, the green on a par four. Like it's short. You, I mean, you have to launch it and it's super skinny. You so you have par to get 70 par 70, 5,000, I think oh, 5,000 wow. yardage. Um, uh, so just a really cool course. Uh, I wanted to play it cause I, I, it's been like five years since I played it and we have to go back and like shoot a video and everything, but, um, just a, a great place. And they have like a really cool, like overall resort there. So we will need to go back there again. Um, and another place that we should go is to clear Creek where you went and you went fly fishing, caught a couple rainbows. Yeah. So my best friend just bought a house on clear Creek and, I won't divulge any information with like where it is and or, or who he is, but um, he it, f- below his house is Clear Creek, and you know it's it was the trout opener on Saturday, April twenty fourth, I believe. Yeah, twenty fourth, and so that was the first day of the year. And from from our vantage point, no one fishes that section of the river. For one, it's super difficult to get in. We had to hike down from his house. We hiked down this large hill, and then you kind of have to, like, rock climb down from there. But once you get down, it is so gorgeous, and there's just these deep, skinny pools. And, uh, yeah, I pulled out a couple beautiful rainbow trout. And I I can't remember ever fishing Clear Creek before, to be honest, but our, our uh, father, Chip, um, he actually used to do st- – trout surveys in that river and so for cow trout so i called him up and he's like this is what you do you do this this and this and you're guaranteed to catch a fish he's like it's super easy um so yeah i caught him on a nymph two different different uh types of nymphs and uh i will be going back in the next couple weeks when i go I'll, every time i go to Reading now we're just gonna um we're, we're just gonna catch fish on clear creek when you catch two beautiful so much fun. rainbows in that i mean in that short period of time it's like and you have it right there might as well go there every time you have and, the yeah it was a pain getting in and out i'll say that it was really hard because that i mean that's probably why it doesn't give any fishing pressure it's so protected by a canyon but 
once you get down there, there was kind of like this flat area. I mean, clearly people had been hiking in and fishing there. There was like this area where you can comfortably sit. There's no trees or anything to worry about tangles. The rocks on the bottom are super smooth. So you're not tangling on the bottom, you know, when you're, and, and it's probably, even though it's like 15 feet wide right there, it's 15 feet deep. So you get your fly super far down into the water and those, they just come and grab it. And it's like super easy to fish there. That's awesome. Um, so luckily, you know, I have a way to get in there through private land. I, I feel like a lot of people don't, but there's all sorts of sections of Clear Creek that people can go fish. Super underrated spot to fish, not only in Redding, but just in Northern California in general. So, Well, it sounds like a successful content trip. Yes, it was good. I, I'm glad I went. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, and it's good, you know, we're working with our friends at Discover Cisco again now that everything's opened back up there again. So I'm stoked to be going up there once, once a month and shooting content and doing some fun stuff with them. That sounds great. I can't wait to go back with you to golf Mount Shasta yes. uh, and help you video that. Yeah. Um, but bef- I had one thing that I wanted to, to kind of talk about before we really get into the news of the week. Okay. Um, I've, I've been, we've been mentioning, so, you know, Northern California, it's dry here and it sucks when we get rain, we get snow, we get a lot more fun things to do. So we have mentioned that we tend to talk a lot about the lack of rain on this podcast because it's just in the news. Uh, but I, I decided I needed to make a sound to just play every time we have kind of a downer drought related kind of topic okay oh we do we not have any this week oh we yeah. don't have any this week and oh so, but <laughs> and this the is the first week in like a month that we haven't talked about the drought i have a couple, uh, a couple i'll, I'll, I'll make sure to add one for next week no so you no can... well don't force anything but I no think i actually we, ha- we actually have some articles queued up about the drought so don't and, and this might not be the only time we have this conversation because i have a couple options here and i might continue making these these sounds but uh, uh initially i was thinking just keep it simple and so i think what we'll probably end up using most commonly is remember the movie along came polly yep there's a scene where Philip Seymour Hoffman is playing basketball with Ben Stiller, and he's just throwing brick after brick, but he keeps yelling, "All right!" And I think that's hilarious because that is he a just great keeps scene. just keeps Rest it. right at over and over and bricking it. Also, in that scene is another thing that I'll probably use. Rain dance. I think that that is an absolute <laughs> hilarious sound. Okay, so these uh, again are probably. Did you watch be... Along Came Polly this weekend? No, I didn't. I you, uh, you just... many times. Okay. But, now those are going to be the ones that we probably use most frequently. But I did spend some time making some other ones. Okay, and I went down. Let's. I, I went back. I went really, really early. Okay, so the first one that I made is is probably the oldest uh, sound that you may recognize. Raindrops need to start falling on our heads Because we need the rain in Northern California Did you do a full recording session? So, that, I'm not, we're just getting started, kid. So, that's the oldest song that oh you would my. kind of associate <laughs> with rain. Raindrop, you know. So, but we had to put our own little twist on it. Now, we got to make a music video now. Like, well, that was electric. There's more to come. Okay, so, all right. I wanted to, after that, the older song, I wanted to get a little bit more. It's not a... It's not a new song by any means, but it's a, a lot newer than, than the one that we just okay. talked about. We're only happy when it rains. Because we really need the rain in NorCal. Now, we're not just... Wait, wait, wait. Was that you singing? Yes. Do you have, like, some sort of auto-tune going on? You sound super weird. I'm really good. So, but because... (laughs) Was that your punk voice? Oh, it was like a 90s kind of... Yeah, kind of my punk voice. That's also a woman singing the song. It is. What what woman is that? What's It's from Garbage. Oh, Garbage. Garbage. That's a whole Garbage. garbage, same thing. Now, sometimes we do drop f bombs and cuss words in this podcast, but generally speaking, I'd say we're kind of a, a more family we oriented try, we podcast. Try to so, not you know, be too I gotta, I gotta bring everyone into this. Everybody's gotta get a song. Please make it rain, do 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 do. Make it rain, do 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 do. Make it rain, do 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 in Northern Cali. What? 
I had no idea you had done all this. I have one more, and it's probably my favorite. It's the one that really kind of came to my mind first. Um, and it might be the shortest, but. Better grab your umbrella. I'll make it rain. I'll make it rain. I'll make it rain in NorCal. <laughs> so we have some options. Wait, wait, wait. You subbed out them hoes for NorCal. I just re. I just did the whole song over. Yeah. Uh. So so. So you, just, if you think you're escaping without doing a full music video, I mean, we gotta pick a song. Well, I think that one was the best. I think the last one was the best. Oh uh, yeah. Better grab your umbrella, I'll make it rain, I'll make it rain, I'll make it rain in NorCal. Yeah, no, I had some fun with this. Uh, so we have Baby Shark, <laughs> we have Garbage, we have BJ Thomas, we have Fat Joe, and then the two Along Came Polly uh, sounds. Again, I had a good time making these, so I will probably make more. But uh, this whole let's make it rain kind of sound thing is, uh, well, this is just the beginning of this. What type of music do you think you were the best at? Uh, I don't know. I think I had the most fun with the garbage one. And was this like late night on 420 that you did all this? Like, this is like the most random thing I've ever heard from you. Uh, I did it last night. I guess I made one today because I was just bored, but they take almost no time. The, the time it took was to make, to find the songs and cut the song. Yeah, uh, that yeah. It didn't really take that long because pretty much every version of a song has an instrumental karaoke version on, uh, that you can download and just, you don't have, you don't have to worry about, you know, piracy. Well, now that you do all this editing stuff, we're going to have to turn it into like one of those morning radio shows, like coming to you live. Choo -choo -choo! That's... I mean, we already do the the adventures in NorCal. Remember, every time we used to go up north and do a, an adventure, we would listen to uh, Z Rock and the X. And so, out of six X, we we used to always just in the car, just the X. X. Oh my God, that you. Kudos to you. That was fantastic. Now I'm expecting big things from you out of the future. So I hope you carve out some time in your life because I don't know how long that takes, but it seems not like long. It's pretty... I had fun with it. It's not over. So stay tuned. Great job, Bob. Thank you. I, I appreciate the work you've done and we'll have to we'll have we'll you, I'll now have to put water stuff in because we're going to have a lot of them this summer just so you can play that. Stuff. Rain dance. Just excellent. All right, let's get into the notes of the week. First, let's do it. News note of the week. Officials moving forward with a plan to drop 2,900 pounds on Farron Islands. This is rat killer, if I'm not mistaken, is it not? So the Farallon Islands has had this problem for a while, and they have over 1,000 mice uh, running around this, you know, wildlife rich island it's about 30 miles off the coast of san francisco and it's the highest density of rodents on the planet you so a thousand that seems pretty low you just said there's a thousand rats on this and it seems like thousands that, maybe thousands yeah because yeah, like if this is the highest concentration of rats i'm sure a thousand is a bit a bit low maybe. on that uh, estimation scale yeah, I, I dropping, they, they probably don't know. It's it's basically the entire land of the Farallon Islands is covered in rats. They're they're dropping twenty nine hundred pounds worth of poison. So there, of poison there's got to be more bait. than a thousand rats. Yes. So here's and this is a controversial plan, and we'll we'll get into that. But here's sort of the uh, history behind it. In the eighteen hundreds, seal hunters would boat out from San Francisco to the Farallon Islands, and um, that the Farallon Islands is known. They have tons of uh, birds. They have tons of marine wildlife. They have a ton of sharks. And uh, they would boat out there to go fishing and go hunting and bring mice, stowaways, on their ships, and they would hop out onto it, and they just started mating, and, and now the population has exploded. So wildlife officials don't know what to do about this because it impacts the ecosystem a ton of different ways. They... They eat stuff, and um, they've brought, like, owls to the area, which is super weird. And so they're, they're dumping basically one and a half tons of rodent side on the islands and hoping to kill all of them. And it may kill some other species, but they think this is the best way to 
uh, preserve the ecosystem for the future. It's a best solution for a long, uh, potential long-term problem. This is a drastic measure, and it's going to solve things quickly. And it's a terror. I mean, who wants to drop 2,900 pounds of poison on anything that's a wildlife refuge, fair, pretty much? Um I can't say I disagree with this, though, you know? Yeah, so uh, it's with everything we do like this, there there seems to always be something else that w- we haven't figured out that it's going to go wrong with it. It's we, talk, we talked about it when we were on the Trinity River where they're trying to form the river their own way, and we're just, we try to play God a little bit too sure. much with our natural resources. But they have been... They have been arguing this and investigating it and doing research on it for many years now. And this is their plan. And they they voted on it. And um, this is the best way to go about it. So it's fascinating. I mean, these are, you know, these islands are not like habitable for humans, but they are just a really good place to learn about the uh, marine wildlife out on the Northern California coast. And um, these rats have taken over the island. And um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how they do it. I don't know how you just drop all that poison onto an island like that. Like Doesn't a, it get in the water? Like an atomic bomb. Of yeah, the yeah. Side. Yeah, we're hiroshima the uh, Hiroshima-ing the island. Uh, I'd the love island. to see a video of that. Well, I'm just, there, be, there better be a video. Um, this uh, I'll say this does it's not it's not the same but it does remind me of the uh, buffalo on Catalina Island how uh, it was a filmmaker in the 1930s brought over buffalo to Catalina for a film and it was actually easier to just leave them on the island and they thought they'd just die but they bred and they are still there. When I went uh, camping there probably ten years ago, a buffalo walked through our campsite. Now they're not. Do they have ne- negative impacts on the ecosystem? Not really. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's almost like it's a um, it's a tourist. It's a th- it's another reason to go to Catalina Island. So they're not hurting anything. They just kind of add to uh, the the allure that is Catalina Island. And yeah, they're not like rats taking over and completely devastating the rest of the ecosystem. But it did remind me of it similarly. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of examples of this sort of human involvement with nature around the world. How we bring in non-native species of some sort, and um, they go wild on on ecosystems. Uh, so th- they're they're planning to do this in 2021 and twenty twenty two, late fall winter um, when the bird populations are historically low, just to limit the amount of birds they kill. But I mean, this is they're gonna. Kill a lot of animals. Yeah. And this is, I, they basically say they need to get rid of every single mouse that's on this island. Well, if there's two and they're the, the uh, you know, opposite sex, then the, that problem is going to continue, you know, unless until they kill Correct. every single one of them, it, they they tend to breed in an exponential number. And I, I, I've read a lot about this and they this does seem to be the best possible outcome. I just want to say that there are always repercussions it's the butterfly effect right it's uh anytime you do something there are different outcomes that you couldn't have ever foreseen and i wonder um if that will be the case this time yep well we'll see we'll see uh we'll keep a close eye on this r.i.p rats uh okay let's go to the next story this is kind of a follow-up to a story we've talked many times about another skydiver killed at the embattled lodi skydive center yeah, this is uh, this happened a couple of weeks ago, but we we haven't been able to talk about it yet. Um, it seems like something we're talking about every week at this point. Um, they recently lost this forty million dollar lawsuit for a, a a teenager, an eighteen year old that died at the parachute center, and they're basically trying to get the owner out of the building um, because there are a lot of deaths at this um, at, in Lodi at the skydiving center. Um, they just named the woman today and I have it right here. It is Sabrina call 57 years old from Watsonville. And according to the owner, she had like something like 2000 jumps, very experienced, very experienced jumper. The, the, you know, some of the previous who had died on 
like one of their first jumps they'd ever been on. This was a, this seems like a, a bit of a unique story for this particular uh, skydive center, whereas she was an incredibly experienced diver. They're thinking that it was about a pair uh, tangled parachute, right. um, which is, you know, obviously never good. I've always thought, you know, when we went skydiving, I remember thinking, who packed the chute? Like, can I see that person? Because I just want to put eyes on them and make sure that they look, like they know how to put a, pa- a parachute together, you know. Well, if you pack a parachute two thousand times, yeah, I know one might well, one might mess up, and that you know that's um, sort of what I got from it. Uh, what's interesting is it, it, the owner actually ha- has spoken, and he has not spoken a lot, um, but you know he he sort of said a lot of things that we've been saying, which is. Skydiving's dangerous. And he said something like, you know, people have heart attacks when they're playing tennis and they take that risk because they like playing tennis. And you can't, it's, he's right, right? I mean, anything in life comes with, comes with certain risks. That being said, a small, a small operation like this, we, you don't see fatalities like this. So this is why the lawsuit that they have that they just he just lost, um, they're trying to get him out of this skydiving center because they just say he he runs it poorly. Yeah, we're we like going on adventures. We have both been skydiving before. It's something that we want to encourage other people to do. And so it sucks that we have to just talk about it in such a negative way about this particular place. But there are a lot of places in California where you can go skydive. We encourage it as long as you go to a reputable, uh, you know, skydive center that has a good reputation. Um, it's a great experience, but you're absolutely right. It's an inherently dangerous thing to do to jump out of a moving airplane at 12,000 feet with nothing but a little bit of uh, fabric to keep you from you and hitting the ground at 120 miles an hour. It's an inherently dangerous sport. Yes. And, and there are a couple things that I read from, from both what happened here and his comments. First and foremost, when they go in to do investigations for this sort of accident, for this sort of fatality, all they can really look at is if they packed their shoot right. And in this case, you probably, she probably didn't, right? She probably, something happened with her shoe. Um, so that, that's, that leads me to the next point, which is the owner, Doss, who basically said, of all these fatalities that we've had, not a single one is the same, right? They're all a little bit different. And so if you're going to say that we have a problem, you, you can't say that we have a singular problem you know, problem, they're, they're all different and they're all accidents. These sort of things happen in which case he's probably right. It's not like everyone's dying from the same thing there in which, um, well, and especially if this woman packed her own shoe, correct. You know, it's like, what are they supposed, how are they supposed to know that she's been, she's a very, very experienced, uh, you know, are, are they supposed to double check? That's there's nowhere in the rules where somebody has to double check you, um, packing your shoot, right. I'm clearly, I'm sure she didn't mean to pack the shoot wrong you know like nobody right. want, I, I mean maybe i mean somebody has asked me before if you knew you were gonna die how would you want to go out that'd probably be the way i'd do it because you can see yeah. it coming it's quick it's easy as long as it is successful but um i don't think she meant to do that yeah it's it's terrible but someone who skydives two thousand times is probably uh she's pro- probably had some close calls before probably knows of the risk and is willing to accept said fate um, if an accident were to occur, I mean, that's the whole, you know, that's every, that's what skydivers love about it, I think. Um, so, you know, it, it, are these deaths going to continue to occur and are we going to continue to talk about it? I'm not sure, but this has become highly controversial. This is sort of the biggest place in NorCal to, to jump. And this is where I jumped. And so it's kind of one of our only options. And yet it is a terrifying <laughs> option. So uh, that's why we keep talking about it. And um, if this place is going to stay open, is it going to be under the same ownership? Is he going to leave eventually, especially after losing a $40 million lawsuit, which in this um, article, you know, he says he won't say whether he's actually going to pay it. Um, I don't know how a person that owns owns a skydiving center has $40 million anyway. So 
Uh, we'll keep an eye on it, but another sad story out of Lodi, and uh, it sucks that we got to keep talking about this stuff. All right, last story of the day. Sacramento Trail, named one of best in America. This is actually right down the street from my house. Yeah, did you know about the Jedediah Smith Memorial Trail? I've heard of it. So it is, it's also, it's around here, it's known as the American River Trail, the American River Bike Trail, and it goes for 32 miles from Folsom Lake to the Sacramento River. And it's pretty magnificent. I've I've done some portions of it. Um, I've actually fished right off it a couple times. But the fact that it was covered in USA Today as one of the best in America is, is actually quite shocking to me. <laughs> it, it, so and let me just let it was best recreational trail in America, meaning, you know, probably paved and for multi-use people. So, um, but yeah, this is, it's like a huge biking trail. It, it, there's a ton of like rafters that will drop in along this trail and fishermen. And I actually know I've, I, a lot of people I know that they will, commute to San Sacramento to work from Folsom and they'll just bike this in the morning and bike it back at night. I mean, they're hardcore cyclists, but I wish I had a bike. I would absolutely be riding this more. If I'm being honest with you, the portion of this trail near my house is not the safest part of that particular trail. So the one by your house, that's on the, that's in the North side of the river. I, I believe the official trail is, uh, well, maybe it does cross the river at some point. I looked at a map, and it looks like that. It crosses the river. Is my, the, it's the trail that is known as being fairly highly trafficked with people that don't that live there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's um, the nation's longest paved bike specific paths in the nation. It, it has um, great views of Folsom Lake, American River, and um, Lake Natomas. Lake Natomas, super underrated. It is like this little river slash lake uh, between Lake Folsom and the American River that you can kayak, you can paddleboard. There's beaches. Um, so, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I, I think a lot of people don't know about this area and what the American River specifically in the Sacramento area offers for people. It, it's not a, a dirt trail. It's not a place where you're going to get, you know, high up views. It doesn't have peaks. It doesn't have waterfalls, but it is historical. It's really fishy. There's a lot of fish going through there. I'm actually going to hit that up uh, soon for the shad run on the American, which is fire. Um, and it was a big part of the gold rush. So uh, fascinating that USA Today highlighted a trail <laughs> in Sacramento. I need to get a bike again because I miss it. It helps me get outside, and uh, as soon as I do, I'll be riding this trail all the time. Yeah, thir 32 miles is not that bad. No, no. Yeah. I uh, do 10 miles in an hour with leisure. Yeah, yeah, and you can, I mean, it's it's pretty flat most of the way, and you can go all the way to Folsom Lake. Pretty cool. And that does it for the NorCal News of the Week. All right, that does it. So now we're getting into uh, the coolest part of this uh well, minus, minus your sweet sounds that you made earlier. <laughs> We're getting into the coolest part of this podcast because I'm really excited to welcome on Alyssa Winkleman and Ari Cassell, who kayaked from Mount Shasta to the San Francisco Bay. Took them 21 days, and they're making an awesome documentary about it. So excited to talk to them. So let's go to Alyssa and Ari. All right, we'd now like to welcome on two very special guests, someone we've been eyeing for a long time to have come talk to us. We have uh, two ladies from the SAC Source to Sea, Alyssa Winkleman and Ari, Ari Kosel. Uh, did I say that right, Ari? Yeah, you got it. Okay, so um, you two just completed one of the most magnificent journeys in Northern California. You did the entire Sacramento River for uh, approximately what, 300, 400 miles? Yeah, it was, uh, it was over 400 miles. 
<laughs> from Mount Shasta to the San Francisco Bay. Um, it, it, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and we've been following you for a long time. So I'm curious, how was this journey sort of born? Like who came up with the idea and what was it like until you actually began on uh, March 14th? Um, so I came up with the idea. I think it was kind of just like a ran like a distant idea in my head for a couple years. And then this last fall, I started thinking about it more seriously and asked Ari if she was interested in doing this. And she was like totally in. And, um, so that was in October and Basically from October until we launched, we just were kind of figuring out what our game plan was going to be. And initially we're like, let's just go on a rafting adventure, boating adventure, you know? Um, but then realized there were so many issues going on with the sack that would be really cool to highlight. And we felt like there was more of a mission there for us. Um, we both grew up on the upper sack, did our boat our first we both did our first um, river guide training there and it felt really special to us. So it felt like, Hey, we could, you know, broaden our scope of knowledge about the sack and hopefully educate the public a little bit. So that's where the idea for a film came about. So we found Jamie trap, our filmmaker from Alaska and just kind of got going from there. It really became kind of, almost like a full-time job for a little while, the whole planning process and getting sponsors and reaching out to stakeholders and just getting everything organized. So, and I'd love to talk about the documentary and, and sort of, you know, how that's going and what, what we can expect. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, how are you guys unique, uniquely qualified to make this, this trek? And, um, has anyone done it before you? Yeah. So there have been several groups or solo adventures who have done um, source to see or source to see variations on the Sacramento, either starting um, somewhere near Box Canyon Dam um, or below Shasta Dam. Um, but I think we're one of the first groups to try and go from a really high point um, of Cliff Lake. Uh, which is, yeah, one of the sources, the true sources of the SAC. And I think another thing that made us unique was, um, as far as we know, we're like the only all-female crew to have completed mm. a host of on the SAC. And yeah, I think we all brought something a little bit unique to the table. Like Alyssa said, we both grew up here on the upper SAC and did our guide training um, and just our river lovers and river women. Um, but then, yeah, finding Jamie, who uh, <laughs> she likes to say filled the unique niche role of um, filmmaker, woman, and uh, pack rafter <laughs> slash sea kayaker. Uh, we felt pretty lucky to find someone who filled those qualifications. And um, Alyssa is a Sufferfest queen. <laughs> I'm pretty chill, mellow. Jamie's just a big goober. So that also makes us unique, I guess. <laughs> So you say suffer fest, you're, you're like the, like you like to go on long, like trail runs and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I like long trail runs. Um, but I like things where you're more in like a type two fun state of mind for the majority of it, or at least portions of it. Um, and I kind of anticipated this trip being somewhere in the type one and a half type two fun range. And it was, um, so yeah, I like things that are hard to do and, you know, feel like super accomplished afterwards. So you mentioned you, you guys started sort of high up, uh, and you skied down, right? You skied down to, uh, I guess L Lake Siskiyou and then you went around the, the dam and then you obviously, I mean, you did a million things, you pack rafted, then you, you got actual kayaks and kayaked out to sea. Did you have someone sort of following you along and, and helping you like move all this stuff around all these different um, obstacles that you guys had throughout the journey? 
Well, we had a ton of support from the start to the finish, but in terms of the actual trip, we, once we were on the water post our ski, we did all the portages ourselves. So Shasta Dam, Keswick, and then the Diversion Dam in Redding. Um, part of the reason we chose pack rafts was that they're super packable and lightweight. So we wouldn't need, you know, a vehicle to help us get around any of those things. And we wanted to be as self-sufficient as possible, but on a big journey like that, you need your community. So we had friends and family, um, do a couple resupplies for us for food. But other than that, we were out there in the middle of the state on our own. <laughs> yeah. And we were really lucky that, um, Kathy, who runs Delta Kayak Adventures, um, she mm. met us in Ninth Landing and brought the sea kayaks to us. Um, we did that transition and was like incredible support, like so, so generous, uh, loaning us those boats for that portion of our trip. So yeah, like Alyssa said, it's lots of support. Yeah, there's so many people that call the Sacramento River home and it's uniquely personal to me. I mean, I grew up on the, the river in Redding and my dad actually wrote a book on the Sacramento River when I was young. Um, so I have a ton of ex experiences there. Now we're actually located in Sacramento and I still drive past the Sacramento River. And I always think, you know, um, it snowed on Mount Shasta 50 years ago and then that pops out of the ground and goes into all these different lakes and rivers all the way to the ocean. And it really is, is a connective experience for the entire region, the entire state, you know? So I sort of love how it, it just connects everyone. Um, I'm guessing that this journey was sort of a personal bucket list for you, but what else did you want to accomplish with this trip and with this documentary? Well, like I mentioned before, there's so many issues going on in the SAC with water and water allotment and different um, projects that are going on, like the Delta Tunnels. And a lot of people in the state don't know about most of those issues. You know, the issues range from water, enough water for salmon, uh, water quality, having enough water for farmers and, and the whole ag industry. And then, um, you know, like there's a lot of endangered species on the Sacramento River. So we just really wanted to highlight some of those things. And we are still in the process of connecting with stakeholders. But along the journey, our mission was to connect with as many folks as we could and do interviews while we were out there and have that sense of place. You know, like we're in their home and we're able to see what issues they're experiencing firsthand and so that felt really important and we learned a ton and we're still learning a ton. And so really hoping that we can share everything that we learned and all the experiences we had with these folks and um, yeah, just pass it along to the public and make people more aware, you know, in a state where water is kind of the biggest issue at hand, a lot of people don't even know about it. So hoping we can just reach more folks. And I think another thing that kind of made us unique because there have been um, different documentaries done on the SAC and some of the issues surrounding water and um, social and environmental issues but we really were trying to keep a pretty open mind and not necessarily take a particular stance or have an agenda that we were pushing our main goal was just to learn and listen and then use our ability to you know, float and collect stories um, as a means of, like Alyssa said, just sharing that information with the public and elevating these voices so that then people can kind of make decisions for themselves or get excited and curious and dig deeper into issues that really spoke to them and resonated. But our, our goal was really just to try and give equal opportunity or an equal voice to everyone that we could connect with. <laughs> So I'm curious because I, you know, the information we collect on all these issues is, is through a lot of different resources and you build your opinions based on that. Um, I'm curious, did your experiences and talking to these people along the way, did it change your perception on these issues or did it reaffirm your, uh, your original thoughts about the, the water issues along the Sacramento river? 
I would say for me personally, um, I definitely have some strong opinions about some of the issues going on on all rivers. Um, but again, like we wanted to come into this with open minds. And so I definitely tried to set aside those biases, but I think a lot of what we learned did reaffirm some of the biases that I personally had. And I don't think that that's something that we're going to necessarily share, you know, we're going to continue with our story in, in the film of like, these are the issues and make your own decision. But I think for me personally, I, it reaffirmed some of the things that I was thinking. And then I learned about new things that I didn't even know were issues. And now I feel pretty strongly about those things. So um, I think it's hard to have an experience like that and not form opinions. Right. Even if you're trying to be open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. I would echo what Alyssa said and just add that um, I think it was such a good learning experience in terms of recognizing that, you know, everybody has a reason for believing what they believe and you might not necessarily agree with it, but it, it's important to at least hear and understand where they're coming from. And one thing that I found really amazing and remarkable was that a lot of the stakeholders were actively doing that for each other. You know, like they're, they're coming from their lived experience and their, their understanding of the issue and yet would often highlight you know, maybe someone or an opinion that's on the other side from them and acknowledge it. And I thought that was pretty incredible that there was this mutual understanding of like, we're not on the same page, but we ultimately all love the Sacramento River and care about the river and value it. So that there was that common theme throughout. Yeah. The river's got so many different, um, uses for so many different people in the, in the state. Right. I, I always remember, uh, I, I, when I got a couple, uh, tr speeding tickets when I was younger and I went to driving school and the, the instructor said, well, everyone on the road has a different agenda. And that's why everyone's sort of crossing with each other and cutting each other off. And I think about the sack in the same way. Right. Um, you know, we, we talk to people who are in the recreation business on Shasta Lake and they're like, yeah, raise the dam. Like that. That just helps us. But then you look at all the other things it impacts. And, um, so there's, there's just so many different, um, perspectives on this stuff. And, you know, as we're learning now, building these dams has like a huge impact on, uh, on years from now, right? 50 years from now, hundred years from now. Um, so we're continuing to learn this stuff and I, I appreciate what you guys are doing sort of bringing it to light. Um, so, so your, your trek let's, I want to hear about specifically what it's like, because there's all these different sections of the river and different ecosystems. Um, so give me a general overview of your trip, um, source to see. Um, so the source <clears throat> or one of the sources, so the source is kind of, uh, it, it's made up of a few different um, springs and creeks and lakes that all run into the South Fork of the Sacramento River. That's kind of the term that most people use in the area. And the source that we started at was Cliff Lake, which is um, I think like 6,500 feet. And when we went up there, we snowmobiled up there. It was still quite snowy and it was actually snowing that day as well. And um, so we started in kind of a subalpine setting, you know, lots of evergreen um, and everything else was still hibernating for winter. So not a lot of plant life that we're seeing. And then once we got down on to the sack below uh, Box Canyon Dam and down um, in the Sims area, stuff started to look a little spring-like. Um, it was actually like the morning we left, it had snowed a foot overnight and we were in Mount Shasta. And once we got down on the river, it was like spring and it was lovely. Um, so yeah, once we got down there, it had, the environment had changed a little bit. The ecosystem was, you know, it's still alpine ish, but you've got more oak and um, like willow, alder, 
Yeah. So it's kind of, it starts to change a little bit more, th- more um, dogwood. Yeah. And stuff wasn't really blooming yet. So it was still, it's still winter. Right. Late March. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then once we got down below Shasta Dam and into the Redding area, lots of live oaks and um, sycamore and cypress. Cottonwood. Cottonwood. And the water quality was still pretty good at that point. Um, but then we got, we did have some rain, only really like two days of rain on the whole trip, uh, right around when we were passing through Redding. And that immediately did change the water quality because um, many mm. of the creeks that were flowing into the sack were then increasing, you know, silt and runoff. And so the water became more turbid. Um, which, yeah, one of the things that was highlighted a lot through different stakeholders was just like how important the turbid water really is, especially for um, steelhead who are moving either up or downstream. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, once we got down further into the valley, we were in a lot of agricultural land, farmland, and we really started getting you know, the, there are levees at that point once you get down south of Calusa. And so really from the river, it's kind of hard to see much going on. And there was actually one day where I was like, I got to get out of my boat and get on top of the levee because I don't know where I am. This is weird. And in addition to that, you lose a lot of the riparian habitat once the levees are built. And so, you know, it's really just like walled in and it feels very channelized and like a canal in some places. But despite that, there was still a lot of wildlife, which was really surprising. Like, I think I saw more types of birds on that river than I have on any river. And we saw beavers and otters. And so the plant, the wildlife was really um, pretty rich still, Mm -hmm. despite the lack of plant life. Right. And then we got to um, below the confluence of the Feather River coming in, um, just above Sac. That's where we saw our first sea lion that was working its way. Yeah. Um, so we encountered a few sea lions, and yeah, we floated through downtown Sacramento, which was quite an interesting experience to just yes. be paddling. Yeah. Next to, um, I think we hit it on a Saturday, so a lot of people were out enjoying the spring weather and their boats and partying and. Having a great it can time. Get pretty crowded right there under yeah, the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> we had some near misses with big boats. Um, <laughs> and at that point, too, that was kind of when we really first started feeling the effects of um, the tidal influence coming in from the Delta and the Bay. And so that's when, fortunately, we had, we had switched to sea kayaks in Night's Landing and were a little bit more streamlined and efficient in our paddling. Um, but our our days became much more dependent on um, timing and, you know, trying to sync up with the, the ebb flow heading out um, so that we weren't fighting the, the incoming tide. And um, once we got through the Delta and reached below like Sassoon Marsh, that's when we were encountering, you know, big freight ships and yeah. uh, passing under huge landmarks like the um, Martinez, Carquinez Bridge and, um, you know, the Richmond Bridge and getting more into the bay and feeling, feeling a little bit more on the open water. Um, definitely had a few moments where the tide switched and we weren't quite where we wanted to be and really felt the effects of that. (laughs) So, uh, Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I think it was two podcasts ago. We were, we were talking about your guys' journey and I was like, I cannot believe they kayaked through the bay like that. And I didn't know you guys had switched kayaks. So I thought you were on pack rafts, but I've actually sailed that bay quite a bit and it is treacherous sometimes. And, um, with all the ships and, and everything, was that a scary experience? Yeah, I would say um, probably some of the most like terrifying moments of my life now up to this point, because <laughs> I'm not a sea kayaker. And um, so that was like definitely out of my comfort zone, which I appreciate now in the moment I was 
panicked half the time. Um, but it was interesting for sure, because, you know, the title aspect didn't feel too nerve wracking, but if it was really windy, you know, if you got a huge gust, there could be, you know, wind high, like creating waves that could tip you over for sure. And, um, then just big yachts don't really slow down. So they get, you get a ton of wake from them and then going around some points, you know, it, it gets really choppy. So that all was pretty intimidating for sure. I think that's where, uh, again, the community support came in really clutch. And um, like, again, Kathy gave us like tide charts and alternate routes cool. that we could do. Um, just banking on her incredible knowledge of the bay and of sea kayaking there. Um, you know, Jamie has more experience with sea kayaking. So she was kind of like the grounding rock for Alyssa and I, <laughs> who definitely were more outside of our comfort zone. And so her experience with um, even, you know, being able to communicate with other boats via um, walkie talkies or radios uh, was really important. And um, just her calming presence, I think helped us out at moments, but it was, it was definitely a new experience for both Alyssa and I, because like we said, we're river people, but not necessarily <laughs> sea kayak people. Um, but it was great being in the day, you know, we saw like some whales and some porpoises yeah. and uh, totally different wildlife, more marine wildlife. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Right in the middle of uh, whale migration season. Um, did you, I'm guessing you just hugged the north side of the bay and went like around Angel Island, right? Yeah. So once we got um, past Benicia and through the Carquina Strait, we stayed on the south shore for a while until Point Penal, and we um, camped in that area. And then from P Point Penal, we crossed. We kind of hugged the south shore of San Pablo Bay, and then. Um, going under the Richmond Bridge is when we crossed over towards Angel Island. And then we actually camped on Angel Island. Don't tell the Park Service. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think we, I think it was fine what we did. I think you actually can camp there. Um, well, I, I've done it before. You absolutely can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then from Angel Island to the Golden Gate was pretty quick. But um, yeah, we tried to minimize our open water crossings as best as possible. Just so that <laughs> We're not in our freak out zone for very long. <laughs> right. But we did have um, really great weather going mm -hmm. through the Carquina Strait. Actually, there was a, lo a lot of folks had warned us, oh, that's super treacherous. But we had almost like glass that day. It was really amazing. And that was probably the best day in the bay, just yeah, in terms of weather and wind. And but that was actually the day where we like almost got the tide timing right I think we could it seems like we could paddle like 25 miles with the ebb tide but then once it switched we we had like three miles to go and we just I mean I think that we spent 45 minutes in the same place paddling as hard as we could and we're like we're not moving um and then got to shore and just waited the tide out for a couple hours and um then made it to our campsite but that was I think the main day where we didn't yeah. get the tide quite right the tides keep you humble for sure yeah oh yeah the ocean it's a powerful beast isn't it um was that your hardest day on the trip that was our longest day for sure um well, what, what was the, your most difficult obstacle throughout this entire uh journey Oh, <laughs> You're, the look on your faces. It, it was all hard. I'm guessing. <laughs> I don't know. I think for me, um, I think it was just the long stretches of flat water, especially before switching into sea kayaks where, you know, we just weren't as efficient. Um, and, but yeah, I, I think just like the monotony of a long stretch of flat water, the saving grace would be when we'd have um, a, a connection with a stakeholder or an interview set up because that I think grounded us and reminded us of like, this is why we're out here. But otherwise, if it's just like a hot day, cause you know, it was getting warm 70, 80 degrees and you're just like paddling these long stretches, it could be a little bit like, 
oh, what are we doing again? What? <laughs> yeah, I think like from Calusa to the Delta were some of the hardest days for sure, just because there's very little current. And so it really was just like flat water for 25 to 30 miles some of those days. I think actually the hardest day now I'm remembering was from, oh. um, we stayed at the Sacramento Yacht Club. We like made friends. And yeah. um, so we stayed there. And then from there to the or near Walnut Grove, that was probably the hardest day for sure. Yeah. We were all pretty tired and hadn't had a rest day yet. And that was a 30 mile day. Yeah. All, yeah. All flat water and starting to feel the, the effects of the tide too. Mm. What was your favorite part of the trip? Hmm. I really liked our like afternoon and evening on Angel Island. That like stands out as one of my favorite just like days, I think. And I think it made it even better because going from Point Penal to Angel Island, I was like the most terrified of the whole trip I'd been because it was really choppy and there were boats that seemed like they didn't see us and, um, getting into Raccoon Street was really terrifying for me. Um, so I think that afternoon was just amazing and we had great weather. Yeah, that that day definitely stands out. Um, I think overall, just the connections that we made were phenomenal, uh, especially, you know, coming out a year, a year of COVID and having the experience and the privilege to be able to like essentially travel and and have those spontaneous connections come up where people were just overwhelmingly kind, generous, went out of their way to connect with us and support us and share their knowledge and passion and experience with the SAC. And I think that was soul filling for me, for sure. Um, and I think for the whole group of just yeah. feeling so connected again in a way that uh, I think we we had missed and had been craving and we hope that we were able to share some of that via our you know our social media and just the stories that we were sharing yeah, yeah you guys have done a great job with your social I enjoy following it cool thanks um yeah I think just the amount of people that wanted to be part of what we were doing and support us was really I think at first a little like, whoa, this is why this is cool. Everybody's so interested. Like, and we were on um, Channel 7 News when we went through Reading. And after that, we had a lot of people emailing us like, oh, I live here. If you guys want to like camp at my house or, you know, I have a couple extra bedrooms. And so we actually stayed with a woman in Red Bluff that lived on the river and offered us laundry and she said she was going to take us to dinner and she had showers. like yeah showers and three extra rooms because all her kids were raised and um yeah and fortunately it rained really hard that night so we were super grateful to be warm and inside and dry yeah. um but yeah it was just like everybody was so welcoming it was it was it still feels like a dream kind of <laughs> It's, it's such an interesting journey because you're almost like through hikers on like the PCT. Didn't you call yourself like through paddlers or through yeah. kayakers? Yeah, totally. And yeah, we definitely experienced, you know, on through hiking um, with the PCT or the AT, yeah. there's like trail magic where people will come and um, meet you on the trail and deliver you know, resupplies or goodies or just help you out in some way. And we definitely felt a lot of river magic where, you know, um, friends or total strangers would just uh, leave us little goodies or come meet us and deliver pizza or, you know, all this, all these amazing examples of just genuine kindness. And um, yeah, we were so grateful. Well, I, th I think everyone's truly appreciative of like, of you just educating and bringing to light the issues of the river. And, um, like I said, it, it connects us all, even as like, it's a shit show going through Sacramento, but it still means a lot to people in Sacramento. Right. And, uh, like you guys, you stopped at Scotty's landing. Like I, I love Scotty's. I went to school in Chico. So, uh, there's so many ways that it connects everyone, um, 
in Northern California that I think that's why it was like so personal to everyone. Yeah. Agreed. And that felt uh, really cool to experience too. Cause uh, being at the source, growing up at the source, I think to me, for me anyway, it felt like a little bit of a disconnect from what the rest of the state experiences with the river. And I feel super privileged to live here because we have like the, the water comes from, you know, all the water in the state comes from here or for the Northern part of the state comes from here and it's super clear and the river is like crystal clear and cold. So swimming in it, you feel like super refreshed and great. And as you get further down, that's not the same experience for everyone. And so, but everybody still loves it. So that was really special to see like, I'm, I feel super privileged, but all these other people do too, because it's such a great mm -hmm. river. Yeah. We asked a lot of people along the way, just like, what does the sack mean to them? And it was incredible. What a broad, uh, spectrum of emotions and feelings that came up. But I think the, the overwhelming takeaway was just like how much the sack really means to people. Like it, it touches people. It's like, uh, like you said, it's a connecting force, this, you know, fluid movement that brings us all together. So that was really cool to experience. Yeah. It's, and it's funny you mentioned like, cause you guys grew up on the upper sack and you both, you, uh, had a lot of experience on the upper sack, right? Rafting it. Yeah. Um, that is the only stretch where it's like that and the entire way. And, and quite frankly, any communities it goes through are super small and, and it, it goes through a lot of communities that are much bigger where it's just slow and, and large. So your, um, experience with it throughout your life is, is rather unique compared to the rest of people. So, um, that's super interesting. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, spoil the documentary, but if you think there's one issue on the Sacramento river moving in the next 10, 20, 50 years, what do you think it is? Ooh. I mean, this might, this might be vague, but I also think it's just so true. It's just like, um, you know, the amount of water and how it gets distributed. I think that's the biggest issue that is, kind of houses all the other sub issues you know there's just a limited supply of water and a lot of people and projects and species relying on it and so how do we distribute it in a way that meets the needs as equitably as possible because there's not enough to go around agreed that's a great way to put it um so when, what's, what's next? When is the documentary out? Um, are, how long are you guys working on it? I know these, these processes take a long time. Yeah. So Jamie has started working on it and she is hoping to have like a rough cut in the next couple months. And then we'll just kind of keep fine tuning it. I think our our ideal would be to have it by this fall, but you know, life happens and it gets busy we all have jobs so um that's our goal and then we're hoping in the next few months to have time to produce a podcast as well because some of the interviews that we had were so long and meaningful and informative that there it's not gonna all make it into the film and so we really want to be sure to highlight those interviews as well and go a little deeper on some of the issues because the film will be more of like, um, like it kind of narrowing in on some themes and then talking about all the issues, but it'll be a little more broad. And so through the podcast, we hope to dig deeper on some of those issues and really help inform the public. And then we're also shifting our website from what it was before, which was kind of like, here's a trip we're doing, an adventure we're doing, to now more of a informative resource for people to go and see you know like oh this is this person they talk to and this is a resource that I could find out more information about this subject and just kind of dig a little deeper so that we have three different platforms for people to experience our trip different ways like visually audi auditory or um, reading so yeah that's kind of what's next 
That's great. I love the idea of a podcast because when you talk about the Sacramento river, it really branches off into a million different topics, right? I mean, there it's never ending all the tributaries that flow into it. Um, I mean, talk about you're connecting now, uh, exponentially more communities, you know, when you, like the American river comes into it and the feather and the McLeod and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that's, that's, that would be awesome. Um, how can people follow you guys? How can people donate to you? Um, how, how can our audience help you out? Great questions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have a couple of ways to connect with us. We have a website, which is sacsourcetosee.com. And then our Instagram handle is sacsourcetosee, but with the number two instead of written out T-O. The website is T-O. Um, and then on our website, there is a link to donate to our GoFundMe campaign. And we are still fundraising because um, an aspect of our trip that we wanted to honor was just like the woman empowerment portion of three women doing this adventure together. And so we are ambassadors for the Cairn Project, spelled C-A-I-R-N. Um, and they're an amazing nonprofit group that does a lot to increase access to the outdoors, especially for young women. Um, but for women in general. And so our goal is to continue fundraising um, as ambassadors for the Karen Project so that any of the additional funds that don't go towards the film or post-production um, will be put towards, yeah, increasing access to the outdoors for women and young, young women, especially more locally and focused on water sports. Amazing. Uh, everyone go, go follow them and donate because I know, you know, these things, there's a lot of costs associated and a lot of time that you have to put into these types of things. And, um, these sort of resources I think are really important for our region and all the different communities of Northern California. So follow them. We'll put the links to your donations and, uh, your, uh, website and Instagram in the link of this podcast. Um, Ari, Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today. You guys are amazing. We're really big fans. And um, once, once the documentary gets rolling and maybe you're getting ready to release, we'll have you back on and we can talk about some more, okay? Yeah, oh, that'd be amazing. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And we do plan on doing a little like film tour with the film in some of the communities that we stopped. And so once that gets closer, we'll be happy to share that information as well yeah yes we'll uh, have a release tour yeah i love yeah. it that's well thank you guys so much it was great meeting you yeah, you yeah too. thanks for having us it's thank been you. awesome all right that was amazing those are some badass chicks Alyssa and ari from sack source to see uh stoked we got them on the podcast because we've talked about them a couple times uh, what was your initial reaction from this from the interview. I, we, I've talked about it before. Uh, I'm just jealous of, of the trek that they made. They did it properly. They got sponsors. They, you know, uh, as I mentioned, they were on a KRCR and that opened up a lot of people that were reaching out to them and, and offering them their homes and going and offering them to buy them dinner. So uh, my biggest takeaway is that I was jealous. Yeah, I mean, it's hard work what they did, what they were talking about through the Delta. It slows down and they're basically paddling 30 miles a day. Um, uh, you know, what strikes me and I wish I, I, I thought of this during the interview and I would have told them is this is sort of the, the next generation of, of outdoor people, right? They are, um, conservationists, they are filmmakers, they are social media, uh, savvy, um, and they just, they care. And, uh, I think that, you know, this role that we've had, that we have the people who, are in the outdoors and they care about the outdoors. Um, I think it's really blossoming for a lot of these young people who are connected to these outdoor areas. And these are just, you know, Ari and Alyssa are just two examples of people who are going to help bring, you know, this this dynamic, the outdoor dynamic in America um, into the future. So really cool to talk to them. I'm stoked to see the documentary. It's also really cool that, like, 
it's really easy to make a documentary these days. You know, I got enough content not, to make a documentary. That's for sure. Well, not like really easy. I don't want to say that because they did spend, they did 21 days on the river. They did a ton of interviews. They're still doing interviews. And the, the editing, the is editing just starting get, to get underway. The editing's going to be, so I don't want to say it's easy, but it's like anyone with the, you know, that, um, puts the time and energy into it can do it. And that's what's so cool about this and i i think it's going to be an awesome documentary i hope they put it into uh like some film festivals and and all that stuff so we'll keep covering this and um and let you know when it comes out and when they do their film tour and everything but thanks again to Alyssa and ari for joining us that was really cool and thank you to you for listening to the talking norcal podcast uh remember to go subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts we're on Apple, we're on Google, we're on Stitcher, we're on Spotify. Follow us on YouTube, both Active NorCal and Talking NorCal, for clips of these podcasts, as well as the full uh, podcast on the Talking NorCal YouTube page. Also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We're everywhere. Uh, we really appreciate your support, and thanks for listening. And remember... Stay active. NorCal, we're hell in NorCal. And I could spend all day just chilling in the South Bay. We're NorCal, we're hell in NorCal. And Gary knows how to do to kick it down in Santa Cruz or NorCal. We're hell in NorCal. And we get a little cray cray when we visit the East Bay. We're NorCal, we're hell in NorCal. And we get a little mental when we visit Sacramento. Yeah, we're NorCal, we're hell in NorCal. And we punch out in Nature's County when we visit Humboldt County. Yeah, we're NorCal, we're hell in NorCal. And me, Hella cool, the south of Vince, Sebastopol, we're NorCal, we're hella NorCal, and you know that we got.